have talked about extraction of gold and we saw that a good deal of gold that is present in elemental form as small particles embedded in rock surfaces can be extracted by this ionization process. Of course, gold can come from other sources like during the extraction of base metals, it will go through the process steps and finally, during electro refining of copper for example, it will be found in anode slimes. Similarly, in the case of silver, there are also silver ores and some 25 percent of silver is obtained from silver ore proper. But 75 percent of silver comes from the during the processing of base metals, mainly processing of lead because lead ores contain silver as A G 2 S. I have had I have mentioned how you remove silver during refining of the lead bullion that is produced in the lead blast furnace. Let us quickly go through that step again. The base bullion that is produced in the lead blast furnace contains many impurities and one important impurity is silver. Now, the essential steps is that by aeration and drossing, the slag would be removed, antimony will be taken out. Then by addition of sulfur, sulfur, copper will be removed from the bullion. Then there is this park desilverization process, which removes sulfur and that is by addition of zinc. When zinc is added to lead, there is a silver zinc lead crust that forms. The rest of the lead will go for de-zinc into market and from that zinc can be separated out by volatilization. We are left with a lead zinc alloy. Again after cupellation, silver bullion is found. So, much of silver comes from the uh, during the processing of lead that is one of the main sources of lead production. Now, let us come to platinum group metals. Again platinum group metals are not found as uh, metal chunks of metals here and there. They are found with sulphides deposits of South Africa or copper nickel sulphide ores in Canada and Russia. And again I mentioned the sulphides are very good solvents for precious metals, gold, silver and platinum. But in our country, the sulphide deposits that we have do not contain that much of platinum group metals, it contains gold and silver all right. But in deposits of South Africa, sulphide deposits, there are lots of platinum, copper nickel deposits of Canada and Russia also have platinum. And they can be derived, obtained from the slimes during electro refining of copper everywhere. Maybe in our case also there can be some amount of platinum. But let us see how it is done in those countries where there is lot more platinum metals in the platinum metal concentrate. You have to find a way of making concentrate like we did in the case of gold before it went for cyanidation. Now, in this case, the leaching reagent is not cyanide, nor acid, nor alkali. They are highly noble metals, so they have to be leached by aqua regia. In aqua regia is a combination of two acids. Now, in aqua regia, again, some metals like rhodium, ruthenium, iridium, silver, they do not dissolve in aqua regia that will form a residue and we will talk later about how we treat the residue. 
residue, but platinum, gold and palladium they dissolve in aqua regia. And after we got a solution, we go through solvent extraction. In the organic phase, gold will come in. In the aqueous phase, we will go platinum and platinum rhodium, platinum and palladium. So, there is a separation here during the solvent extraction process. Gold goes into the organic phase, solvent stripping will give gold solution. Then it can go for precipitation, anode casting, electro refining, etcetera. We get gold from here. The aqueous phase will have platinum and palladium. And there are chemical steps for precipitation of these, like ammonium chloride treatment, we get a solution that will have palladium in solution, and there are certain steps, etcetera, etcetera, you get uh, palladium here. And for platinum, we have some step. So, essentially, the important thing that I want to impress is in the case of platinum, we cannot have cyanide leaching, acid leaching, or alkali leaching. We have to go for aqua regia, which will dissolve gold, platinum, and palladium, and there are ways and means of separating them. The residue that has the other platinum group of metals and silver that will be treated separately. Now, this is how we separate. Now, there is silver there. Now, silver always dissolves in lead. So, the first thing will be to take out the silver by dissolving in lead, which will be produced by a pyrometrical process, a very interesting process. So, we will go for a lead smelting with the residue and we will add TBO and coke, so that we produce lead that will dissolve the silver that is there in that residue. So, the slag contains uh, the lead that comes will have that silver, the slag would have some nickel that will go for nickel processing, because normally uh, as I said it comes from sulphides which have con which contain nickel, but the lead would contain silver and the other things. So, ammonia the nitric acid leaching will take lead and silver into solution and then there is a way of precipitating uh, taking lead uh, silver in solution, then certain steps we can get silver grains. Whereas, the residue after bisulphate fusion will give us RH and iridium. These are various chemical steps. The thing to remember is after aqua regia leach, we get a solution which would have gold and platinum, palladium, the residue would have silver and other platinum group of metals. Silver will be recovered by taking into solution in lead. This lead is introduced as TBO and introduced into a smelter like a blast furnace operation where coke is also introduced and lead bullion will have in it silver it will also have in it the RE, uh, RE, REU and iridium. So, these are various chemical steps, so you need not know the uh, details. Okay. Now, that brings me to the last thing I want to discuss before I finish extraction of non ferrous metals. And then I would like to move into the subject of energy and environment in relation to whatever we have discussed so far. I mentioned earlier that secondary metals come from scrap. What is the importance of secondary metals? The importance 
arises from the following considerations. First, if scrap is recycled, then the environment is cleaned. Suppose you find a junkyard of metal scrap, all kinds of metal. It is occupying land, it is an eyesore, it is bad, bad for the environment, it could have some unpleasant consequences, but it's a, it is a valuable material simply discarded as waste. So, it cannot be tolerated in the environment. So, we need to take it out of the environment, recycle it after cleaning. Now, producing metals from scrap requires less energy, obviously, because we have already brought it up to a high metallic value. At one time, it was the metal. Now, as a scrap also, most of the metallic value is intact. It has been rejected because it is no longer useful for the consumer application or it may have picked up minor impurity elements and when it is left in the environment, it will pick up some impurities from the environment. But essentially, it is, it has the metallic value intact. So, obviously, we can far more easily extract metal from that than metal from ores and minerals. So, reducing or producing metals from the scrap would require less energy. More bulk of the work has been done already. There is another advantage. If you recycle metal, the scrap, then you are not causing depletion of the primary resources. You do not have to go to fresh ores and minerals for extraction of metals that you can get from the scrap. And when you leave the primary sources intact, which means you are leaving the land intact, you are not touching the ores and minerals. And I also mentioned some time ago that eventually a day will come when we will we'll not touch earth too much, we will keep on recircling whatever we have produced uh, by the industry, it will be recirculated. Some amount may have to be formed because after all it cannot be 100 percent uh, recirculation, but that should be the goal that we, we recirculate as much as scrap as we can, so that we do not cause depletion of primary resources <coughs> if we can help it, so, some amount we have to do. Now, I mentioned that by recirculating actually you save on energy consumption. Why do we need so much of energy for producing metals from ores and minerals? Because first of all, many of them are not present in as high grade uh, minerals. Many of them are present in very minor amounts and so you need elaborate processing steps and they that require a lot of energy. I will discuss later even crushing and grinding require enormous amount of energy. When you have a scrap, many energy consuming steps are not there anymore and that is why energy requirement for the sec secondary metal production would be much lower. Now, here are some figures. Uh, Consider magnesium, primary from ore, so many million kilocalories per ton, 90.2, from secondary sources it will be only 3, if you have magnesium scrap. Aluminum 61.5, why they are so energy intensive? Because they depend on electrolytic processes which require a lot of energy, it is only 3. Nickel 36.3, 3.8, zinc 16.4, 4.5, steel 8.1, 3.3, 6.8 and 3.3. Why here the energy consumption from primary ore is not so high? Obviously, for steel the 
iron ore is very high grade, you do not have to go through elaborate uh, beneficiation steps. In the case of lead, it is so easy to reduce. You can, the blast furnace operation is at a lower temperature. So, in this case also, the energy requirement is far less compared to the energy requirement for magnesium and aluminum. But still, there is a lot of difference uh, in the energy that you require to produce uh, steel from iron ore than steel from scrap or lead from um, primary resources than lead from secondary resources. Now, I have forgotten to type the figure for copper, which I will do after this lecture. For copper, this will be 20, the from primary sources it will be 28.2 and it will be only 4.5 here, 28.2 and 4.5 for copper. So, in all, you see in all cases, it is far easier energy wise to produce a secondary metal as compared to production from primary sources. Now, there are some practical problems. The practical problems are collection of the scrap, it is not always so easy. When I was very young, I was interested in trying to see if we can recirculate the from the ordinary batteries, the metal strip that we have. If you take this ordinary torch batteries, if you remove scratch the surface, remove the piece of paper, you will find a, a zinc strip all around. It is very pure metal. Why cannot you take that out and produce check and recirculate that metal? The problem is there are logistics problems. And I had actually written to a company, the company said it will cost much more to collect the used batteries from wherever they are discarded and take that piece of metal and clean it and produce it than what you get from primary sources, which is true. Because we do not we can produce now with within reasonable uh, cost from the primary sources, we are not worrying about it. But suppose we did not have uh, the metal from the primary sources, we would have to fall back upon it and find a way of doing things. For example, why could not we have a method that every time you buy a new battery from a shop, you will be required to submit the old battery or the shop owner will give you a discount for the old battery. If that was there, the retail outlets would also become collection uh, centers for the scrap from which again the companies can buy that. It is not done, but I believe in our country, <coughs> there is a phenomenal number of entrepreneurs about which we do not know. There must be people who are doing this already because there are entrepreneurs who recirculate so many things in so many ways. I have seen old tires being cut and used for making very inexpensive chappals. I do not know whether you have seen it. It is a very innovative way of using discarded tires. Otherwise, tires are of no use at all. And the rubber companies are not interested in collecting old tires and, uh, and reprocessing them. But people do take old tires, cut them into chappals, and those chappals are very long lasting because tires are very tough rubber. Similarly, I suspect there are entrepreneurs who do this collection. In all the rag pickers we find, they pick up things, there are organized groups who have been trained to pick up this or that. So, many metals are recirculated, but not in an organized manner. Now, there is a danger if things are done in a disorganized manner, then there can be some unhappy consequences. Let me give you an example of something which can be recirculated quite easily. 
it is the secondary lead. You know this lead scrap does not corrode because lead is something uh, which can stay for centuries uh, as uh, as it is. Actually, many Roman ruins are now being excavated, and in the Romans use uh, lead in piping extensively. So, many Roman buildings when they are dug out today, they find that lead pipes are still intact, they can still be used for plumbing. Now, it is another matter that that was not a very healthy thing, because that can lead to lead poisoning, but the fact remains lead scrap does not corrode. And hence, high proportion of lead scrap can be recycled easily. Now, the largest source of lead scrap is from acid batteries, all the acid batteries you see in cars there are plenty of lead in there. So, the first thing will be that lead containing grids and fillings are separated and then metal is recovered by blast furnace melting, very simple. Now, this is one case where you can go and give the old battery and buy a new battery and they will give you some discount say an old battery lead acid battery will cost some 4000 rupees, perhaps they will give you 200 rupees for the old battery. Why? Because there is an organized way of recirculating the lead used in batteries. Unfortunately, we do not know what happened to that uh, old battery then. That again goes into the hands of the disorganized sector. I was told and maybe it is still true that in Calcutta there are hundreds if not thousands of small entrepreneurs whose job is to produce lead from the lead in old batteries. What they do is break open the, the battery take out the lead plates and they have homemade blast furnaces. It is not very easy, you know some kind of this drums that you use in the road making the coal tar comes in those drums. They will put some refractory uh, bricks inside and they will put the lead thing there, they will melt it and they would have some flux and then maybe they would put some there will be some air injection whatever, they will create some slag to take out the impurity and lead will come out with or without air blast whatever. Now, this is very dangerous because if you are doing lead smelting in this crude furnaces, you generate lot of lead fumes and many of these operators are inhaling lead fumes and dying. So, this is illegal. So, what the government does is once in a while there will be uh, some some policemen will come to enforce environmental regulations. They will close down when this is happening and if they close down what do they do? The people simply go to another place and start doing that. This would not have happened if we had an organized way of recirculating lead. I am not very aware, aware where this happens. Because again, when it is done in a small scale by private entrepreneurs, you know they do not work for too much of profit, they work just to survive. So, it is very difficult to uh, kill this practice all over Calcutta, in all many big cities, this is happening, and more cars we have on the road, more of this will happen, there will be more lead fumes, not only locally but the lead, lead fumes should also travel to longer distances. In the neighborhood also, there will be lead, lead fumes. It is happening because it is very easy to recirculate lead. Lead does not corrode, all you need to collect them, melt them. If there is some impurities, slag them off, the whole thing comes out as lead and there is a ready market for it. Lead can be sold, it is a commodity which has a utility value, which has an exchange value it can be sold very easily. It is not so easy 
for some other metal scrap. For example, consider secondary zinc. Zinc, secondary zinc mainly comes from brass and zinc dross. Brass, you know, brass is a copper zinc alloy, which is found in so many places. Uh, you know, all all our vessels in copper, brass plates, brass statues, sculpture. But most of it comes from zinc dross. Zinc dross is formed during galvanization. All the steel pipes that we find a white zinc layer there for protection from corrosion, they are made by dipping the steel pipes in molten zinc and a layer of zinc coats the surface of zinc. Now, when surface of steel, when that is happening, some iron also dissolves in the zinc bath. So, after some time, we form something called dross, which is no longer effective in doing galvanization. It has to be thrown out. So, you start with pure zinc, a pool of pure zinc, which is used for galvanizing steel pipes, but during the process of galvanization, some iron is also going into the zinc pool and gradually it builds up into a dross, which is no longer effective in galvanization. It has to be removed and thrown out. This dross actually is a compound. Its formula is Fe Zn 13. It contains about 6.2 percent iron. The rest is zinc. Zinc after all is a very high atomic weight. Now, this can have some extra zinc also trapped. So, the, the whole zinc dross is not APZN13, it has some zinc trapped inside that. Now, how do we get zinc out of that so that we can it can be recirculated? It is easy to remove the trapped zinc. To remove the trapped zinc, we simply have to melt the whole thing and by a decantation process, zinc can be separated out. Now, recovery of the zinc from this compound is more tricky. One method would be distillation that yes, we can take it up to high enough temperature that will break it and zinc can be distilled off. A simpler process would involve displacement of zinc by aluminum, which from FeAl3 and this can be done by adding aluminum to molten dross. Now, here the a small amount of weight of aluminum is going to release a large amount of zinc, because first of all and it comes to 1 kg of zinc will produce 13 kg, 1 kg of aluminum will produce 13 kg of zinc from 30 kg dross, but you are consuming some aluminum you have to find out the economics of that. You will waste 1 kg of aluminum, but you will produce 13 kg of zinc and you are going to treat 30 kg of dross. Maybe there is some use for Fe Al 3 that I do not know. Now, why this process is very attractive is because the melting point of Fe Al 3 is 1160 degrees, it is higher and its density is half. So, separation from zinc which melting point of 419 is good. So, in the dross when we add aluminum we will form uh, Fe Al Cl 3, it will get separated out very easily from liquid zinc whose melting point is lower. So, we have a clean separation of molten zinc and solid Fe uh, Al 3, but we have to consume certain amount of aluminum. So, you have to waste that. So, these two are very important processes for uh, recovery of lead and zinc. As regards recovery from copper scrap, 
I have given a flow sheet here. Uh, you can try to see, and I will, I will try to read it up. If you have low gauge copper scrap, one way of getting copper will be to have it briquetted and in a compact form. Then it will go for blast furnace smelting, where we had coke, where we had limestone, we had iron ore. So, it is almost like uh, a blast furnace smelting for production of iron. The idea will be to produce black copper, which will have iron and copper together, and there will be a slag, which will have a small amount of copper that is discarded. There will be gas. In that gas, there can be zinc oxide, there can be tin or other lead oxides, if that is there in the copper scrap. But essentially, we are taking out copper through blast furnace melting as black copper containing 85 to 90 percent copper and rest will be iron. Then it will go for converting like what we do in the copper process. During converting, we can add scrap brass, we can add bronze, we can add gun metal, all which contain copper in the scrap. We add coke during converting, that slag will produce will have copper, it will go recirculate for blast furnace melting. But after converting, we can produce blister copper as we did in the case of copper. So, you see here we are using all kinds of scrap, scrap brass, bronze, gun metal and to start with we do that, but then the whole idea is to first take it into uh, first a black copper uh, thing uh, with 80 to 85 to 90 percent copper, then we go through converting blister copper, then in that we can add high grade copper scrap now we have an anode furnace refining, we get an anode um, 97 percent copper, then it will go for electro refining. That electro refining will produce some slimes, we may or may not have precious metals. So, to put it in words, the molten black copper is sent to a converter, where high grade brass or high grade bronze or gun metal scrap is added. Unlike in the case of sulphide mat conversion, there is no sulphur available for oxidation and external fuel has to be provided. That is why we are providing coke for converting. The slag produced contains 30, 35 percent copper and 20 percent zinc and zinc scrap are, uh, are processed for 15 percent tin when tin scrap are treated. The slags are sent to the blast furnace, the converter gases which contain oxides of zinc, tin, lead are sent to gas burning treatment. So, it is a, a, a process mainly for essentially uh, getting copper from all kinds of scrap, but in the process there will be some zinc, tin, lead etcetera, there is a provision for recovering these also. Now, one very important secondary metal is aluminum. How are we going to recover secondary aluminum? You will find aluminum in our everyday life, you know used door frames, window frames, all kinds of aluminum containers, vessels. What do we do with all that aluminum that are lying around? And the use of aluminum for structural applications and the manufacture of containers is increasing gradually. So, the amount of scrap also would be more as time goes. The secondary aluminum would also be there in scrap material in turnings, borings, trimmings, foils, cans, etcetera. The process of recovery of secondary uh, aluminum will be melting of scrap either in a reverberatory or rotary furnace using some fluoride fluxes. These fluxes prevent the loss of aluminum due to oxidation. 
problem is when you melt aluminum, after all you have to come up with a very clean ingot of aluminum, it tends to oxidize. So, we need to cover it up with a fluoride slag. Now, I will read out one or two sentences from my book. For recovering aluminum from impure and mixed scrap, a short shaft furnace is employed. This furnace has a sloping hearth on which the scrap is melted and a four hearth in which the molten aluminum is collected. The unmelted iron and steel are raked out of hearth. The aluminum thus obtained is used to make aluminum copper or aluminum silicon alloys or used as a deoxidant in steel. The impure aluminum can be defined by the bake process. In this process, 25 to 30 percent of magnesium is added to impure aluminum and a mixture cooled to a temperature that is about 130 degrees above the freezing point of aluminum. The metal is next filtered or on a perforated iron plate filter, crushed basalt as a filtering me medium. The resulting, li uh, resulting liquid aluminum is vacuum refined in a vacuum induction furnace. And finally, we get an aluminum that is suitable for commercial production of light alloys. One technique. So, there are methods of processing aluminum scrap for production of aluminum that can be go into the industry again. So, for all kinds of scrap metal, there are many, many methods. I will mention only one now, which is secondary tin. You know, in all steel cans that are used to contain beverages, food items, there is a thin coating of tin. And I think I mentioned about maybe less than 1 percent of the total weight is the weight of that layer of tin. But that layer is so important, we use the word tin to indicate uh, the steel containers. Why we have that uh, layer? Because it is not toxic, it resists corrosion and that is the ideal material. What happens after you throw away the container? The problem is if you do not remove that thin layer, then the container is also not a good scrap for steel making because if the container is sent to a uh, for uh, steel making, then the slag would have tin in it, tin oxide and tin reduced may get into that metal also. So, it, it interferes with steel making process. So, it is neither going for tin production nor going for uh, recirculation of iron. So, if we can remove that tin layer, then it becomes a scrap which is valuable for steel making also and we get value in terms of tin. Now, there are many methods of recovery of that layer of tin and nearly 50 percent of tin produced that is used in the production of plates. The metal is also used as constituent in soldering alloys you know the soldering alloys are scraps also. Bronze and babit alloys also have tin. It is added in some plastics to ensure transparency. The tin is a constituent of paints, industrial fungicides and disinfectants. So, it has a lot of uses, but there are some uses which, uh, which, which make available scrap from which we can extract tin. For the recovery point of view, the tin can scrap is the only worthwhile source tin can scrap that is from where we should try to get tin and the recovery of tin as I mentioned also renders the steel can suitable for use as a valuable scrap addition during electric furnace melting of steel. Tin coated steel cannot be charged in an electric furnace because tin is an unwanted alloying addition and SNO2 will enter the slag phase creating operational problems. The normal thickness of tin coating is 1.5 in the 10 to the power minus 4 centimeter and the weight 
is about 1 percent of the tin cans. So, there is good amount of tin if you can collect a whole lot of cans. Essentially, there are two approaches to that. One is leach it out. I mean, use a leaching reagent which will not attack uh, steel, but will will dissolve tin. There are processes, alkali process or some other chemical process can do it. The other is a chlorination process, where tin is recovered in the form of a liquid chloride by being made to react with chlorine gas in suitable temperatures when made to react with chlorine we can produce SNCl2, which is a liquid, which will simply come out of the uh, surface of the steel surface. But of course, the precautions must be taken to exclude all traces of moisture from the processing in order to avoid corrosion of iron, because you are going to a higher temperature. Moreover, it is also necessary to ensure that the material be free from all organic substances such as paper and straw. There are some other um, uh, details that I can I can uh, exclude. Actually, it is an exothermic process tin 2 C L 2 S N C L 4. It is the tetrachloride that comes out by chlorination an exothermic process and when a chlorination is complete water is cautiously added to cool the liquid and the at this stage essential 4 crystallizes out once you have the essential 4 it's a starting material for uh, tin production that's not difficult then there are some electrolytic processes that you you take it into a solution then electrolytically um, electrolyze so, I have given examples of zinc, lead, aluminum. In the case of all non ferrous metals, there are methods using which you can produce secondary metals. I will not go into it uh, in any further, but at the end, I would like to mention. And there will be reference to this in the next model when I talk about energy and environment. In many metallurgical processes for extraction of non ferrous metals, we produce a waste, not the, I am not talking about scrap, we have uh, produced a waste in some step which takes out important metallic values not metallic value of the metal we are aiming at, but some other metals are in the waste. And we can get metal from those wastes. I would not call it secondary metal, but we will call metals recovered from wastes. There are also application of wastes in some form or other. So, I want to mention one or two words on this. We can get byproducts from slags. In all pyrometallurgical processes, we are producing slags. From slags, we can produce cements, we can produce slag wool, we can produce insulating material, we can produce some ceramics called slag ceramics. But more important is there are valuable metallic elements in many waste products. One of the most important things is the vanadium present from leach liquor during aluminum processing and red mud and vanadium is a very valuable element which is there in the aluminum circuit. Vanadium occurs as a trace impurity in bauxite and constitutes about 0 0.05 percent by weight in bauxite was found in Bihar and some other states. During alkali digestion in the Bayer process, nearly one third of vanadium also dissolved in the process liquor. From the liquor we have to get vanadium out. Some vanadium will go into the slag. 
you have to find extracting vanadium from slag, uh, from red mud. Now, I have told red mud is also very rich in titanium and iron. So, we are not talking about ferrous metallurgy, but we can find ways and means of getting titanium out of the red mud. So, similarly, there are many, many uh, things in non ferrous metallurgy, but then red mud from the aluminum industry is the most important waste product that goes practically unused and there are heaps and heaps of uh, red mud everywhere and the aluminum industry does not know what to do with this red mud and this red mud simply is kept in ponds which occupy large areas. I read somewhere that in West Indies, which is one of the leading producers of aluminum, some 8 or 10 football field size land is consumed every year for simply keeping the red mud. It cannot be dumped into the sea, there is a lot of problems. So, they have to find 8 or 10 football field size areas just to dump red mud. In Odisha, we have if you go to Damanjodi, huge areas have red mud simply for dumping. Now, there is a problem there, it can simply cannot be dumped like this, because if it is in a heap during rains it will all or will flow out and it is alkali there because some alkalis will remain in red mud and the alkali if it goes into the agriculture areas and other areas will play havoc. So, they have to be some kind of uh, cemented uh, tanks in which red mud has to be kept. So, it is a big problem because the red mud is actually a leach residue that is coming from, um, from the Bayer process. It contains up to 22 percent L 2 O 3 also. 50 percent SiO2, 20 percent Fe2O3 and 30 percent TiO2. So, it is also a potential source of aluminum, it contains aluminum, it is a potential source of titanium and the amount is huge. I mean for I have given the data I think maybe I will discuss it later, it is not small quantities that you are producing. There are other industries where you are also producing huge amount of waste. An example is the titanium industry during processing of ilmenite, where our aim is to produce synthetic rutai TiO2. We need to take out that FeO part and that is rejected and kept at one place, about 40 percent FeO reject. There, there are also hills of that. I have talked about chromite mining. In chromite mines, the top layer, soil layer, or we call the overburden, is first removed so that we go into the interior to get to the uh, chromite rich layers. The overburden contains nickel, about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 percent nickel, and also one tenth of that of cobalt is in the chromite in the chromite overburden that have been accumulating in Sukinda mines of Odisha. There are thousands of ton, tons of nickel and cobalt in those that overburden. We still do not have an industry operating to extract that nickel and cobalt and we are importing all the nickel and cobalt we want. We do produce small amounts by processing on some secondary sources. For example, I know there is a company in Baroda which imports from abroad secondary alloys, I mean scrap, scrap uh, stainless steel or catalysts which contain nickel and cobalt and they are processed to produce nickel and cobalt, but we do not have an indigenous industry for production of nickel and cobalt, which can be there if we can process the 
stroking the mice chromite overburden. Now, we have developed processes in the laboratory scales, laboratory scale, but for various reasons uh, we have not been able to put up a commercial process. There are many other, many, many other uh, uh, similar metallurgical waste where metallic values are present and we need to consider how to recover them. I think I will stop it there now and this discussion is taking me very logically towards the issue of energy and environment. And this is what I will do in my last module of lectures and I will do that quite quite thoroughly actually. I will discuss over the next five or six lectures issues related to energy and environment. When some of the things I may have mentioned earlier will be mentioned again in a little more detail. Like we mentioned we produce lot of metallurgical wastes during the processing of any many non-ferrous metals. I will discuss that again what happens. But I would also introduce some very general concepts as regards energy and environment. These are important because today the not no issue is more important than the issue of energy and environment. People are talking about climate change and I am talking today is 22nd December 2009. Only till yesterday, for many days, a big number of countries discussed in Copenhagen the, this, the uh, issues of climate change and global warming. Now, the contribution of non ferrous metal extraction processes towards global warming or climate change may not be very large, and I will tell you it is not very large. Even for the steel industry, the contribution to CO2 emission, emission is only about 5 or 6 percent, but that does not mean that we can be complacent. Everybody has to work towards mitigation of environmental problems. It is not only for global warming, but for local health, local survival, for our own prosperity, for a cleaner lifestyle, everywhere we have to worry about environmental issues and most of these environmental problems are coming from use of excessive energy. We have to cut down on consumption of energy. These issues we are going to discuss. Now, since I mentioned today is 22nd uh, December, I do not know when you are going to listen to this lecture, but since Christmas is only a few days away, I must wish you a Merry Christmas and a very happy new year only which is a few, which is a few days from now. And with that I discuss extraction of non ferrous metals from ores and minerals and also extraction of non ferrous metals when they are not from ores and minerals, but when they are in elemental form, but along with a lot of gang. I have also discussed production of secondary metals which is extraction of metals from scrap. After I discuss energy and environmental issues, I will take maybe two lectures to go through the entire course once again, because I believe you understand processes when you know the principles, but you understand the principles better when you have understood the processes. I hope at the end of all these lectures you have understood a bit about the processes of extraction. If I go back to the principles again, you might understand them bit better. So, with that I conclude module uh, number 8 and the next lecture will start with the last module that will deal with energy and environmental issues. Thank you.